is your 3D printer delicious? In this video, I design and make a paste extruder so I can 3D print Nutella. <music> 3D printers are a capable manufacturing tool that give a maker the ability to realize their ideas but that doesn't mean they can't be modified to further extend their capabilities. One such mod that I've always wanted to try is a paste extruder. That's where you load up something squishy inside a syringe and extrude it in a controlled way. Think clay, silicon, and even food, which I focus on in this video. The reason I've never made one before is that I didn't want to permanently sacrifice a machine for this short-term novelty purpose. But now that I have my Ender 3 fitted with the exchange, I can remove the standard printing tool plate and install my new paste extruder in seconds. Paste extruders on a 3D printer is not a new idea and as such there's a lot to choose from on Thingiverse and no doubt other places. I originally wanted to adapt this design from Richwrap which has been around since 2012. Let me indulge in a bit of fan service. Richwrap has been running his blog since 2010 so when I started in 2013 Richwrap was a source of learning and knowledge for me and therefore someone I really look up to. Unfortunately, the source files were in SketchUp format and I really didn't feel like dealing with that. The variations in design is quite interesting, with this design using an auger screw to drive in the paste and this peristaltic extruder working like fingers pushing toothpaste out of a tube, the fingers in this case being the three bearings and the tube sitting inside the perimeter of the frame. Most concepts utilize a syringe, with this version pulling a belt to gradually pull down the plunger and extrude the paste. But my chosen design style was this one from PU Lab. It uses a nut and screw combination to translate the rotation from the motor into linear motion to push the plunger. Best of all, it had step source files available. I was pretty keen on using this as a basis and I even printed the parts I didn't think I'd need to modify. However, most paste extruder designs, including this one, are designed to suit a particular size syringe. And that's what made me choose to design from scratch. The syringe I purchased was meant to pump engine oil. It was cheap, easily available, and had a generous 80 mil capacity. For the price, the manufacturing quality seemed to be quite good, with the rubber plunger seeming to have a good seal and an additional attachment included to reduce the size of the opening. I didn't use this however, opting instead to utilize the original 5mm opening. The rubber stopper was removable, meaning I no longer needed the plunger mechanism and instead I could 3D print my own part. When I saw how big this was compared to the original syringe used by PU Lab, I knew that I had to go it alone. I started by importing the step file for the exchange tool plate and I elected to use the 31mm spaced holes for my mounting. I then modelled up the syringe, trying to line up the end of the tip to match what I measured on my 3D printer nozzle. I then modelled up the rest of the parts, they're all designed to be printed from PLA, don't require support, and assemble easily. I made some improvements to the final design that you won't see during assembly, but are included in the free files for download. To avoid the need for support material, some of the overhangs are supported by a single layer sacrificial wall, so you need to drill those out and clean up any remaining debris before proceeding with assembly. These three holes are all found in the same lower gear frame part. We can now begin assembly and we start with the exchange tool plate and our base piece. The PCB is removed from the exchange and that gives us access to the holes. We use the nut traps and the M3 hardware to bolt the two parts together before refitting the PCB. Now is a great time to make sure that the syringe fits it should squeeze and clip into place and be held quite snugly. If it's a little bit too tight, you might need to use a file or a Dremel tool to take away a bit of plastic. The next piece is the motor mount. It uses long M3 by 50 bolts and the three lower holes should match. Next up is the lower gear mount and it sits on top of the motor mount. In fact, the four holes line up to mount the stepper motor. Before this, however, there are two M3 holes at the back with nut traps to attach the two parts so they don't jiggle around. We now introduce the stepper motor for the extruder. I found a pancake stepper motor was sufficient for my case because of the 5 to 1 gearing, but if you're extruding something particularly viscous, 
you might need a bigger stepper motor. For now, we only use two M3 bolts on the inner two holes and they must have a button cap to clear the gears that will be above. We now push the small gear down onto the shaft of the stepper motor. As you can see here in this prototype, there's no access to insert the grub screws, but in the final design, I've added a cutout to the two pieces to be able to get in a tool to do just this. For my testing, I found that it worked just fine even without the grub screws. Next up, we'll introduce the lead screw and nut. This is a spare one like you'll find on the Z axis of a 3D printer and somewhere between 170 to 200 millimeters is perfect. You can see I've drilled a hole in the end and that was by putting it in, marking with a dot and then going to the drill press. This step is optional, but it will give you the maximum strength. We don't insert the stopper yet. Instead, we place the lead screw through the large gear and then use four M3 bolts, cutting into the plastic as they go to secure it in place. We now grab the first of our two skateboard bearings and press it into place in the lower gear frame. The lead screw now inserts from the top, coming as far down as it will rest. Make sure you mesh the gears and ensure that they're rotating correctly. Finally, we can introduce the stopper. It pushes onto the end of the lead screw and then we do up our two M3 bolts to secure it in place. One more piece to finish our assembly and it's the upper gear frame. But before we can install it, we need to take one more M3 lock nut and install it into the captive nut location on the lower gear frame. We take another skateboard bearing and press it into place on the upper gear frame. And then we take this piece and fit it over the top of the lead screw into position. The upper and lower gear frames are secured with three M3 by 35 millimeter bolts, two into the top of the stepper motor and the last one into the captive nut we previously installed. We can now take the rubber portion of the syringe and stretch it into position on the end of our printed stopper turn the lead screw to wind the stopper up out of the way, clip the syringe body back into position, and then turn the large cog to see if the plunger goes up and down as we would expect. For me, everything was working immediately and I hope it goes as smoothly for you too. The tool plate and the stepper motor need a cable to connect them. The required length for me was 250 millimeters. This motor needs to spin in the opposite direction to that of the usual Ender 3 extruder, so I wired up the plugs as you can see here. We plug in the stepper motor cable at either end, and then use the three provided holes, along with some cable ties, to ensure that this cable is held in place and does not snag on anything. If we don't connect anything to the thermistor port, it's going to register a negative temperature and give us problems later on. By far the easiest solution is to trim the leads on a 680 ohm resistor and connect this to the thermistor port. You can see that as soon as I plug in the paste extruder, it's going to read a steady 190 degrees. Not so high to trigger max temp, but hot enough to avoid a cold extrusion error. Everything is together, so clearly the next step is setting up the slicer. And let me tell you, the required settings are actually insane. So let me show you how I worked them out. My method is trial and error, so I need something to print. And for that, I modeled up this simple smiley face with five mil thick features. Now to the slicer, and I started by making a copy of my Ender 3 profile, so my original one was left intact. I don't need temperature on the bed or the hot end, so I lowered both of those to five degrees. I upped my nozzle diameter from the usual 0.4 to five millimeters. And to start with, I set retraction to zero, but enabled the vertical lift to five millimeters. I upped my layer height by a factor of 10 from 0.2 to two millimeters. And perhaps the most important changes were in my start G code. I started by turning off linear advance and I added an additional line to use M92 to later set my E steps, but now commented out until they're determined. And on my original Ender 3 profile, I stored things such as my K value for linear advance, my E steps, and my BL Touch Probe offset, so I wouldn't forget them. Back on the Ender 3 paste extruder profile, I found that when I sliced the face, I could see the brim around the outside, but the mouth was missing. So I came back into additions and turned off the skirt. And I also went to advance and allowed single extrusion walls. This finally fixed the slicing and I could see the face as it was intended to be. Time to print. My paste of choice was to be Nutella. 
and I used a butter knife to crudely lump it into the top of the syringe. The syringe clips back into place and then we manually prime the syringe by twisting down the plunger until the metella is just starting to come out the tip. The paste extruded tool plate clips back into the exchange master in a couple of seconds and clips are used to hold down greaseproof paper to keep the printing surface clean. And here is the very first Nutella print on my paste extruder. Firstly, I must have got the positioning of the syringe pretty good as the tip of the syringe is just above the bed when homing. I did forget about the intro line in my start G code, but hey, the Nutella was coming out as intended. Now this footage is sped up as it's quite slow as it prints, but as you can see, Nutella is being extruded from my paste extruder. The line width, however, I'd probably call it generous, especially once we get to the mouth. As you can see, with the retraction turned off, there's quite a lot of blobbing in between the individual sections, and that mouth and those eyes are again way over extruded. But remember, I haven't tried to dial in my E-steps yet. The print is finished, but clearly my NG code is only good for making a mess with this particular setup. Delicious. Now I know that Nutellaface looks bloated and horrible, but the actual extruded design that I'd come up with had worked first go. So now all I had to do was dial it in. I started by measuring my line width and trying to use that to calculate a smaller E-step value. But that wasn't particularly effective. In fact, halving it produced the same over extrusion. I had to reduce it all the way from 93 steps to only five. And that finally gave me a smiley face that kind of matched the preview. Next up, tuning retraction. And retraction is actually excellent on the syringe because as you wind it back the other way, it can literally suck the Nutella back inside the syringe. With a custom start G-code intro line to purge the extruder and a lot of trial and error with my settings, I finally got this, a face with pretty clean separation between the various parts, fairly accurate line widths on the extrusions, and no errant G-code that would get Nutella all over my 3D printer and I was pretty happy. When you compare the first print that I did, compared with my latest results, the difference was night and day. The final settings, 200 millimeters of retraction distance with 35 millimeters extra restart, 10 millimeters of vertical lift, and also coasting for 10 millimeters. Here I'm working in Simplify 3D, but these are all generic settings that would translate over to other slices. Success, and it did take around 15 goes to get it to work, but fortunately, my kids were on hand and happy to help. So let's have some fun with this by printing my first ever peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I started by inserting the correct values for my E-steps, as well as the correct BL touch offsets, into my start G-code in the slicer. I modeled up a 2mm thick square, slightly smaller than the size of the bread, and changed the slicer to remove perimeters, solid layers, and therefore only leave behind a wiggle infill a piece of white bread in place on the printer, and the paste extruder loaded up with jelly, what in Australia we call jam. If you've ever seen a BL Touch homing on a slice of bread before, please let me know in the comments. The actual print I think went fairly well for this. The pattern was reproduced, although there were some gaps, I assume from air bubbles inside the syringe. Time for the second side, and that mean loading up another syringe full of smooth peanut butter. This one didn't really go so hot, as you can see, the peanut butter wouldn't stick to the bread and balled up on the end of the syringe. I ran the same print twice, trying to get enough down, but in the end, the result was pretty bad. Not wanting to sell my experience short, I got a knife and I added liberal amounts of peanut butter and jam in order to make a proper sandwich. Wearing my most American shirt, I took a huge bite to wholeheartedly embrace American culture. The verdict? Well, I was a fan but words can be empty, so actions speak louder and the proof is in the finished sandwich. Another thing that I wanted to try was 3D printing and then cooking pancakes. Google told me that the required temperature was 190 degrees Celsius. So before filling up the syringe, I heated up the bed to a touch over 100 and then poured some pancake batter onto a sheet of greaseproof paper. After letting it sit for a while, it started to look like it might actually be cooking but when I tried to flip it, it was pretty evident that it was still quite doughy in the middle and that the temperature wasn't high enough to cook the pancake. And yes, I still ate it anyway. 
So far, I'd only been printing single layers and really that's only 2D printing. So I wanted to print up. Many times a paste extruder is used for printing clay. I didn't have any of that, but I did have more Nutella. The model of choice was this twisted six-sided vase set up in the slicer to print in vase mode, which should remove the need for retraction. This one actually went remarkably well. Once again, some air bubbles ruined some of the extrusions and I probably need to up my flow rate for the solid infill on the bottom, but it's hard to argue that this isn't going down just like a regular 3D print. When it got to the walls, it worked really well also. Who would have thought that it was viable to 3D print with something like Nutella? Perhaps inevitably, given the structural integrity or lack thereof of Nutella, as the tower grew, it started to droop and eventually the print had to be stopped because it was starting to fail. So much promise at the beginning, but after some time to droop, it didn't look so hot. And I ate the Nutella too. Now I've presented this video in a lighthearted way, but I have no doubt that this paste extruder will be able to make useful ceramic prints and much more. Mounting this to the exchange was an ideal solution. Despite the heavy weight, the system coped without issue and I can convert back to a normal FDM 3D printer in seconds. I've seen the flame wars. I know people express great concern about 3D printed parts touching food, but with my design, only the syringe components ever touch the food and that can easily be removed and washed to keep everything hygienic. Now I enjoyed making this video as a learning experience and also for the novelty. But if you have some practical uses for a paste extruder, please head down to the comments and leave them there. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy and delicious 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.